So thank you for coming, everyone. Um, welcome to the talk, Asian Comics Beyond Manga. Um, the topic of this talk kind of came from an acknowledgement that um, comics of um, artists of an Asian diaspora might be often pigeonholed as manga. And um, this talk was actually sort of just an attempt to figure out what the label of Asian comics or how it differ from manga and what it actually is. And um, so instead of trying to figure out a definition on my own, I decided to invite um, Caitlin Chan, Li Lai and Jason, Jason Chuang to the chat today, which I'm really honored to have on the panel. Um, so how it would go today is that we would each take turns doing a 10 minute to 15 minute sharing each individually of our own creative practices. And then um, we'll be doing like a free discussion on, on um, Asian comics or any um, topics that might come in mind. And at the end of the talk, there'll be a 15 minute Q and A session where we would highly encourage you to open up your mics and ask questions or just, yeah, let's just have a chat in general. Um, don't want this to be like a too serious thing as comics are never that serious. So um, actually I've prepared a nice breaker. Um, hope it's not too cheesy. Um, so as you are aware in Zoom, you can raise your hand virtually. I want to ask a very difficult question. Um, who here reads comics? Can you raise your hand on Zoom if you read comics? Actually, I don't know how to check. Um, okay. Okay, quite a lot of people raised their hands. Thanks for the thumbs up, Caitlin. Um, okay, second question. Who here reads manga? Okay, a lot of people raised their hands as well. I'm just showing off a random manga book here. Um, and who here makes comics? Cool. Um, yeah, there's not much of an icebreaker actually, it's just raising hands, but, but anyways. Um, I wanted to ask these questions because I think actually, as I've mentioned before, being someone Asian and also making comics, sometimes it's really hard to describe your work and especially when manga actually used to be quite um, a term that's more associated with someone being nerdy. And if you are into anime, if you're into reading comic books that you must be like quite nerdy, like you'd be called like a weeb. But, but now comics are, and manga are actually quite associated more towards a trendier subject. And um, so in this meme here that I just highlighted that I randomly found on Google that um, was actually quite interesting for me and how maybe um, how we would mention manga in a way that that probably um, makes it hard to describe our own work and probably manga isn't like the most representative term for everyone's work. Meanwhile, I have nothing against manga because I do read them from time to time. but. Um, so hopefully in this talk, I hope that um, bring in different perspectives from different, different comic artists, which sort of shed light to um, other alternative forms of comics that are other than manga. So um, I can start first and then maybe we'll go to like um, Jason, Caitlin and Lee, if that's okay, I just did a random order. Um, so a bit about me, I'm Kayla, I do comics. Um, um, I also I named my current publishing interest as Crying Sesame Press, which is currently in development because the logo looks quite different from the one in the banner and I'm still sort of starting out the development. But um, my main goal was to support um, future comics publishing and especially people of a more diverse cultural background. Um, and currently I'm working on a comic book called Dai Long Fung Restaurant, which I would be publishing very soon. Um, 
I actually wanted to start off introducing my own work through these pictures I took um, during summer when I was in Hong Kong last year. Um, I've always seen my creative practice in comics as um, sort of like taking a walk outside, um, just sort of gather around everything that's around me. And um, it's almost like a sense of that my mind wanders through comics as well. And it's sort of quite different from how you would plan a really comprehensive plot line in manga, where you have like the main characters and um, they must have, sometimes they have a goal, but um, for me, I think my comics are more selfish and personal in the way that it's almost like me taking a walk through them. Um, it's very, and particularly that on the streets of Hong Kong that I find discovering different textures and materials interesting. Um, the image on the right is an image, I, a picture I took on a wall where all the leaves are torn, torn down from um, sort of marble, um, as I remember, it was that sort of like a wall just um, on the street. And I found that to be quite interesting for when you're just walking out there, you sort of see these very natural um, traces of um, erasure and disposal and also sources of mark making. And I think these are sort of the things that inspire me in my work. Um, So the result of that was um, a zine, which I called 24 Samples from the Streets of Hong Kong. Um, this might not seem to feel like a comic at all, but for me, I think it was quite um, essential that I gathered sort of these patterns and extracted these things from um, the environment I grew up in. And they is eventually are sort of like sequential images that would um, sort of fill into my work. And as you can see here, that I've applied some of those textures and um, sort of bitmappy kind of noise into my comic, which is what I find um, ties into sort of the streets of Hong Kong and um, essentially um, gives a, a vague sense of authenticity, even though um, the storefront of this restaurant I have here in my comic is quite made up and it's not realistic at all to what an actual storefront might appear to be like. Um, I think these are the things I'm continuously exploring in my work would be a sort a sense of um, displacement and sort of the overlapping of just different elements clashing together. Um, my current comic, Dalfung Restaurant, sort of harks back to my memory of um, eating in a traditional Chinese restaurant as a, as a kid. And um, this is the book cover I have now and it's open for pre-order currently at the website. Um, a little plug in there, but never mind. Um, so the name Dai Long Feng um, translates to gigantic dragon and phoenix in Cantonese. Um, it's a common name and a common motif for Chinese restaurants, but it's, it also refers to a Cantonese idiom meaning um, to create a spectacle or halt. Um, it's essentially what I've been doing or trying to challenge in this story. Um, which, as I've referred back to, a sense of um, the overlapping of reality and what is made up and what is actually real and derived from um, an actual image or an actual texture on the street. Um, and um, primarily in comics, I've really enjoyed um, the process of caricature and um, and using the form of that to um, as a form of satire and humor um, because I think essentially comics are not serious they're they're quite fun they're really accessible as a way of communication and um, I think 
the reason why I like comics is that it gives us a space to be playful with things and um, sort of like memes essentially. Um, so I would say back to being the, um, it's always sort of that the, the Asian-ness is never a theme, but it has always influenced my image making and, and how um, we would think of um, the, the story or how the setting might be. And as you can see here that I've sort of taken, a, like taken a piss out of some dishes and, and Chinese cuisine or memes and, and um, in the end turned them into parts of my story. Um, so this is a spread from Down from Restaurant, which um, was a page where characters just ate these really weird um, dish and food items, um, like from the last page. And um, yeah, I think, um, I think essentially um, my work would be just explore, trying to explore so sort of different visual languages um, as to what jokes they can bring out and and what they might be able to represent and challenge through my visual storytelling. Um, last but not least, um, I think taking caricature from um, people's faces are also quite a fun thing for me to do. Um, during the pandemic, I wasn't really able to do much life drawing and, and do much portraits. So I took the advantage of using Instagram filters where people have made in the community there, which they made some really weird and interesting ones. And I just, um, as an attempt to, um, of, um, so of gathering material for almost for like caricature and and making like distorted characters and then they constantly um, changed and became like an extension to my imagination for how um, for how they would look like and these were some of my experimentation. So um, I think ultimately it was sort of definitely. Um, the, the whole premise of Down From Restaurant did come from my childhood memory of eating there and remembering that everything was slightly overwhelming and terrifying and that, um, and that this sort of feeling of unease and um, overwhelmingness and also these like um, clanging of dishes and um, people talking, um, the smell of oily food being passed around eventually made it into the final page of the comic. Um, and these are some of the other pages. So yeah, that's my part of the sharing. May I pass it on to, um, shall I pass it on to Jason next? Uh, do you mind sharing the my PowerPoint for me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that again. Okay, just let me know when you need to pass on to the next page. Yeah. Sure. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Zhuang. I'm an illustrator from Taiwan. And I moved to the UK to study when I was 15. And I was just recently graduated from um, an NA, MA study in visual communication at the RCA. And so basically how I got into comic is in my secondary school, I was drawing like parodies of well-known um, anime movies such as like Twilight or Naruto, you know, all that things that were like popular during my teenage years. And basically just to like entertain myself and my classmates during like classes I find boring. And um, I would say that I consider myself more of a visual storyteller um, rather than um, like a professional comic artist. Um, however, saying that in this talk, um, it will still be mainly focusing on the comic and narrative aspects of my work. Next page. So uh, when I started my BA in illustration, uh, I found a lot of the focus were on either editorial or advertising illustration um, aspects of illustration. 
So um, during that time, I didn't particularly um, find my work um, or myself, you know, fitting into one of those boxes. And I've always had an urge to tell my own stories. So that's when I decided to create myself um, published graphic novel. And this is my first book called The Boy. And it was inspired by my time spent in the military service back in Taiwan. Uh, yeah, we're back in like four or five years ago now. And so it's a 64 page uh, narrative completely created with pencil. And it tells the story of a boy with a vivid imagination, and, but he feels really trapped in life and basically follow his journey. Well, when he goes on about his life and goes into his daydream and comes out of it, and eventually his imagination takes over reality for better or for worse. And so next slide, please. And during my th uh, third year of uni, I self-published my second graphic novel called Tide. It's a 64 page wordless graphic novel created with um, ink and digital. Uh, Tide is about memories and um, emotion that comes with the loss of a relationship and through the transformation of the emotional landscape. So the, basically um, the story is told through um, the protagonist who's having like a shower thoughts and following journey, becoming a bird and flying through this emotional landscape. And um, ultimately the water is the medium that connects the two worlds. So the reality in memory, basically. And I wouldn't say it's my best work. Um, I'm still really glad I made it, but I probably should spend like a lot more time with it because I kind of rushed it to, you know, because back in the back at the time, um, I just wanted to finish the story as soon as possible. So a lot of lessons were learned none of this from this making of this book. Uh, next slide. So um, there was a turning point in my work, especially after these two books. Um, I met with a high profile art director in New York back in 2018 or 19, no? Yeah, and the, these are some of the exact quote that he said to me after um, quickly basically flipping, uh, flip through my books. And it really had an impact on me at the time as my ethnicity uh, never, has never been a conscious part of, you know, like when I create my work. And it shook me as I never thought my work looked, you know, like too Asian or I would consider it as a negative quality to have. But that experience particularly uh, reminded me the importance of using one's voice. And I realized that having an Asian background um, is an integral part to my work. And also um, it influences my experience uh, also being in a Western society since I was young. And so from that point on, I decided to integrate even more of my like own influences into my work and that the main character in my stories will be Asian to um, remind uh, myself and other Asian creators that being Asian is nothing to be ashamed of. And I'm just yeah, to, trying to like utilize my platform as much as possible. Uh, next slide. So after um, my self-published graphic novels, I kind of took a break on making longer, longer form narrative work. Um, but my passion for storytelling was always there. So, and so basically um, during my first year of master's study, I started making short comics. Some of them as short as two panels to try and express um, certain matters in the most effective and poignant imagery. So um, um, interesting enough, I think, the theme of duality seem to surface from time to time. Um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. And apart from duality, I've always been fascinated with um, alternate universes, the construction of narrative arches, and how we can represent um, human psychic. And in a way, and in a broader sense, it's uh, image making and comic, comic is my way of um, trying to fathom my place in the world and to situate my, ex my experience within a particular time and space and archive them. Next slide. And the pandemic strike at the last half of my set, uh, first year of master's study. So a group of us decided to make an anthology reflecting our own experiences during that time. Um, so that results in the uh, collective graphic novel called Sanitizing on Toast. And it somehow awakes my desire to, again, create kind of longer form comics rather than just one page. And so on the bottom right is the poster I created 
for sanitize on toast. At the bottom, oh, sorry, bottom, top, top right. Bottom, bottom right is my um, page spread on, in the book. So next page, please. So uh, this is a four page comic created by, uh, for a literary magazine for Hong Kong and on the thing of aftermaths. And I, for this comic, I decided to pay tribute to someone that I lost. And even though what the comic is trying to communicate might be a bit um, abstract a model, but for me, it's uh, a deeply personal and one of the most literal depiction uh, that I've done. Next page. So in this comic, I experimented using the compartments of a building to substitute the panel of a comic and hoping that this, this will bring, bring a like dimensionality to the story and through the blue walls, um, separating the real world and the memory, which took place spontaneously. Yeah. So the following um, are the last two um, projects that I've done during my year spent in the RCA. And the first project is called, and they both came out of lockdown period um, when I was in, yeah, staying at home all day, yeah, in London. So the first project is called Day Spent in Isolation. And here you can see in part one, I tried to create a um, comic with no definite chronological order. As I'm trying to reflect my experience during lockdown, how everything seemed to merge into an endless loop. And in part, both part one and part two, you can see a habit that I, that I picked up during lockdown, which is watching. And that later on um, kind of became the core concept of my animated short film called In Due Time. So next slide, please. So during lockdown, I also um, became more interested and started to question the idea of the self, the ego and consciousness. And what I learned is um, that the Freudian ego is more about negotiating conflicting impulses and centers, whereas the ego in Eastern philosophy has more to do with um, recognizing what the self actually is. So in the Buddhist point of view, um, we build ourselves through the negative feedback and the positive affirmations because um, egos like certainty, security, and repetition. And that starts to restrict us. And I realized um, throughout my life, I was, uh, kind of feel trapped and kind of have this mentality of like confinement and like always compare myself to the others. And during the time spent in you know, isolation, I kind of realized that was the reason why I was feeling so trapped. So with the short film that comes after this, I had the intention to document this part of my um, journey and finish with a statement in mind. <clears throat> so here I just like to uh, talk a bit about my influences and they're mostly come from sci-fi films. And these are some of the most influential series and films that I love personally. Um, so I love films to do with time travel I love the experimental side of how these films challenge the perception of reality and how they create a storyline that doesn't necessarily follow a linear timeline. And I was really fascinated by the way they build the narrative arches and the creation of dual realities. So I um, yeah, decided to apply that well, nice sub subconsciously in the, throughout my work and especially um, consciously in the short film that I created. So here you can see the visual diary. It's a, it's a basically like a notepad that I keep um, next to my bed and where I just jot down how I feel at the end of the day. And it became um, quite important to me, especially during the lockdown period, because um, as I'm a very sentimental person and my work tend to be quite introspective. So I draw a lot of inspiration from my visual diary basically. And sometimes when I look at them, I can kind of see, um, kind of movement within them. So I turned some of them into GIFs. So there's a, yeah, the next page. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit laggy. Um, so yeah, basically the format itself speed confinement to me because they're kind of like locked into the loop and um, continuously. And yeah, and after that, um, can we go on the next slide? So after that comes the project In Due Time, which is my first um, animated short film inspired by lockdown, confinement, and also touched on the topic of racism, 
which is yeah, which all take place in this kind of like cubicle that the protagonist inhabits. So, um, so there are some here are the screenshots from the film, and you can find the complete film in the link below here. Next page is some more screenshots from the film. Yeah, next page. So this is my latest narrative work. Um, it's an eight-page comic done for publishing house um, Summer Hero for their publication called, I don't know if I should reveal it. No, okay, I won't reveal it. Um, it's an anthology uh, consisting of 11 comic artists, short stories, and they're all responding to the same. Um, same. And um, so my story is called The Guessing Game. And it's about basically two people meeting at the night train and they started to um, play this guess game. And the guessing game acts as a catalyst to um, unlock the memory of the protagonist. Um, yeah, so uh, the publication will be out in October. So keep an eye out on that. And I've seen the whole book, it's looking pretty amazing. So yeah, um, last page, I think. So lastly, I just wanna say that um, with each work, I, I try to push myself further and further into more unfamiliar territories and because I realized that I'm not, I'm not satisfied with being comfortable doing what I know. Um, so you'll probably notice the style in my work changes quite a lot and especially in the narrative work because I don't really think about like Asian comics as a category. Well, not for me anyway, because I, I think I'm just a artist who, hate, who happened to be Asian and there's definitely Asian like background, you know, like my like background influences in my work. However, I think the Asian look doesn't really define me. And I hope that people look at the title Asian comics without much uh, preconceived notion, but rather with an open mind because it could be anything. So that's my presentation. Thank you, everyone. That was so rad. I didn't know that you did animation. Really amazing. Oh my gosh. Thank you, thank you. Going, going after Kayla and Jason is like going after like Beyonce and Prince at a music festival or something. So wish me luck, y'all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. No. Comic Sans for a comic program. Full screen. Okay. Hi, I'm just gonna start a little timer so I don't talk too much. Okay, we're on the clock. Wait, yeah, is it supposed to be me? Yeah, okay, cool, sorry. A little nervous. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm a cartoonist from Hong Kong. And I did a little who is she, but I, I don't want to give too much life detail. But it's just like a little summary. A lot of people ask me if I went to art school, and I didn't. Like I went to a liberal arts college, and I had some fine art classes. So I think I've always been very self conscious about not thinking that my work is, you know, at the level of people who are like professional artists, but I'm still out here making it. So if that's making you doubt yourself, just do it. Um, I started making comics about four years ago. That's when I graduated college and I was just trying to like, you know, like most people find, find a way <laughs> through capitalism and this current time. And I guess I like the way that I've never felt particularly strong at writing or drawing, but in making comics, I think I allow myself to try both and not feel like I have to try to be like very good either. Um, just some little fun facts, like this dating profile. I like graphic novels and go to museums. Um, and I'm, I'm Cantonese, like in terms of my background. And that's a little drawing of me on FaceTime by my friend Gavin. Okay, I'm just gonna go to the next slide. Oops. So uh, I, I kind of made my presentation a little bit also just about this topic, not just about my work. Maybe, maybe because I'm feeling a little self-conscious these days, I don't really like to look at my own work that much, but I will get to it later, like at the end. Um, but right now I just wanted to think to myself, because of my algorithm and my settings, I think all of our Googles yield different results. But I did uh, try to look up, like, what does Asian comics yield? And the results are kind of weird. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Google's kind of weird, but this is sort of weird, I guess. I mean, some of some of it really spoke to me. I think some of us have read, you know, um, Jean Lun Yang's books, and he's great. And I guess it's just like, I guess the term Asian is like, you know, it's a term that almost kind of doesn't mean anything because there's so many countries in Asia and there's like billions of people, right? So that's sort of what I feel like this Google result kind of shows is like this like kind of an oddness there. And I was like, okay, what about just comics? Like no Asian. And 
we got, you know, Scott McCloud, like iconic educator of comics, uh, Adrian Tominay, and some, some diverse comics. And overall, it just kind of made me think about like uh, subcategories and labels. I think maybe that's Rutu Modan. But anyway, these comics looked interesting. And it just made me think about the way that, unfortunately, whenever I looked up like anything to do with Asia, there's always like some caricatures or stylizations of Asian faces that I usually find pretty uncomfortable. But um, I guess it's such a reality of, 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 of visual culture. Um, hi. So I, I decided instead of just to show my work to show some of the influences of Asian art history that's really important to me. On the first slide, I mentioned that I actually studied art history. So I kind of just wanted to bring in all this context and background, a little bit like what Kayla shared about being someone who loves to walk and absorb the environment in Hong Kong. Uh, I don't have any context for the sculpture. I think it's Chinese, but I just thought it was great. Okay, so uh, where, where does my love for comics come from? I didn't grow up with Marvel or DC much in my life. I mean, they had those in like Western comic stores here in Hong Kong, but they're very expensive. And like, I didn't have any income as a child. So I was mainly uh, trying to go to like free museum educational trips with my school, right? And there is a lot of um, graphic sensibility in East Asian painting that I didn't really realize is actually a huge part of how I see art and what I find appealing. Like in this hand scroll we're looking at in the top left corner, there's like a beautiful expressiveness to this figure. And it's just rendered in a way that feels spontaneous, but yet is very deliberate. And similarly, what we're looking at on the right is a illustrations of imperial ritual paraphernalia and military equipment. It's made by a Chinese creator in the, I, it was in a Macanese museum like Macau, which is like a former colony of Portugal. So I wasn't sure if that influence was in the scroll. But what I did notice in the scroll was that there was like a graphic sensibility and compositional textual image layout that I just, it's like kind of like pre-verbal. It just is very appealing to me because it feels like there's a wonderful flow and it doesn't feel like the images and the text are competing with each other. They're, they're kind of harmoniously combining to convey a certain information. And I know that comics are not necessarily informational, but I do think that these kinds of hand scrolls have like a big, big impact in terms of how I see um, what is the relationship between an image and a text. Uh, these are just other things that I think about really often when I'm making comics, like uh, erotic art, including Japanese shunga prints on the left. And on the right, we have a hand-painted Chinese uh, sexual scroll. And I just, I mean, I'm kind of on the A spectrum. So like, I'm not even really a very sexy person, but I just think that these prints have like a wonderful in media rest quality to them where you feel like you're walking in the middle of a movie. And I just think this is before the time of photography. So how is it they were able to make these things that feel so aesthetic? It's like, I mean, I don't know, I guess people just like looked at stuff back then, but I thought they were kind of amazing. And I don't even have an image for the artwork in the middle. I just took a photo of like the title plaque, but like Prince Narahawa crawling through a hole in a wall for rendezvous with his sweetheart. I was like, who, who, who among us has not been there? I just think, I don't know, there's something about the way that we kind of frame and look at Asian art that I find very appealing, actually. Okay, next slide. Um, let's go back to Hong Kong, where I'm from. So what you're looking at on the left is a Cantonese trope, like a performance troupe poster. It's like a performance uh, flyer. And you, some of you may have noticed, like in Kayla's presentation, she had this very expressive typography for Dai Long Fong Restaurant. And this is the kind of typography people would actually use in Cantonese posters. And we have a heritage museum here in Hong Kong that collects this kind of lost visual paraphernalia. And I just think that this is perfect. Like this poster, the amount of information, the amount of graphic elements, this is the highest level to which I am always aspiring and like constantly failing. But this is just like something I think about in the back of my mind is like um, poster culture. And Kayla mentioned Hong Kong has like intense poster culture. Our visual images are just everywhere. So there's a way in which a comic, obviously, you have more space to articulate your narrative and share your ideas. But when I'm making a page, I try and think about these posters and how compelling they are. And just um, on the right, this is from an exhibition in Hong Kong, or Ho Hong Kong, Ho Hong Kong, very Hong Kong, very Hong Kong, in City Hall, Hong Kong, 2017. I unfortunately did not catch the artist's name of this illustrated album cover. But this kind of extra typography and very, um, very laborious illustration with a strong graphic colored element is something that really appeals to me. And this is just something I think about also when I'm embarking on trying to do a graphic novel in spot color. Uh, one more of my influences. Sorry, I'm talking a lot about my influences, but like I'm a big fangirl and like y'all can always Google me later. But <laughs> um, Ng Kai Ho Roger, I saw this composition of his at a group show and I remember just thinking, 
This is a parody of Hong Kong textbook illustrations, but they are done in this absolutely unhinged way. Like there's all this, you know, deliberate use of white paint to look like white out. And there's a way in which I love that comics can have this way of like telling a long story in a single composition, but also using very powerful visual signifiers to communicate a sense of style. Like, um, I mean, in Lee's book, Stone Fruit, there is passages where um, the characters are drawing on paper and then the medium kind of changes a little bit to show that they're drawing on a certain kind of paper. And I just feel like being able to give these kinds of really potent visual cues is like a really fun part of comics. And I'm currently drawing mine digitally, but whenever I look at stuff like this, I just I just crave analog so much because this kind of mark making is so compelling to me. Like, just look at that handwriting. It's like flea and then the market is crossed out examination. Like, it's so great. Um, I have another slide with just like some contemporary Hong Kong comics artists because if y'all gonna invite some Hong Kong comics people to your talk, I'm gonna like have to give a shout out to everyone who like is an influence for me. Um, but yeah, these are just some people who, you know, are all from this place, Hong Kong, where I'm from, but just look at how many styles you have. You have this very painterly, sentimental, beautiful, you know, em emotional colors of Glary. And then Rex is very influenced by manga, but Rex also, I think, is taking comics in like a whole new direction. I've, I've got his graphic novel here, um, Strange Tales of a Walled City. This is a self-published graphic novel, completely wordless. It's like a dystopian story about Hong Kong. Like, he's amazing. Uh, we have T. Hoi, who actually moved to Taiwan. So he's his style is also quite influenced by that visual culture. Um, Overloadance is like these very kind of pink, he calls them like grotesque figures, which I like. Little Thunder is very famous, Yule, uh, Kayla, our friend. And Pearl Law is like an illustrator in Hong Kong who's kind of influenced by BL comics like Boys Love and Dojin Manga, but I think she's taking them in this direction that feels very unique, which is something I like about her. Okay, I've got one minute left to talk about myself. Um, sorry, I also had to shout out these students I saw at a graduation show at Baptist University of Hong Kong, um, Academy of Visual Arts. These kids are the, okay, they're not kids, they're like young adults, but they are the future. I mean, this is undergrad. When I was an undergrad, I was making comics that were like unseeable. So I just thought, wow, I just wanted to kind of shout out Hong Kong because like so much of what people hear about Hong Kong these days is like all extremely depressing, which is important. But I also just want to show like, there are people here that are really trying to think about comics creatively in a fresh way. And the diversity of voices in just this one Asian territory kind of shows you how like rich Asian comics can be, I guess. If maybe if you haven't had a chance to like travel to Asia, if you're not from Asian heritage, I just want to, want to like give a little bit more background about like what's happening on the ground here. Yeah, in terms of comics. Um, okay, to my work, I'm gonna try to wrap this up in one minute. So this is like one of the earliest comics I made. It's a kind of like black marker on tracing paper. And it's sort of about uh, the Chinese photographer Ren Hang who passed away um, in 2017, the year we graduated college. And his he was a queer photographer who suffered from depression, who did a lot of beautiful nude photography. And I just swam a lot that year as a way to kind of process his death. And it was a comics professor who actually told me like, you should you know work on developing your narratives because there are things you might wanna say that you can't just get into a single image, which is what I was doing a lot in my visual arts courses. So this full comic is on the margins, which is Asian American Writers Workshops Literary Journal. If you wanna hit it with a Google, but that's just like one of my first like more serious forays into comics. Uh, <laughs> I feel really embarrassed showing my work after everyone else's work, but it's okay. Um, Emo Night is just like a small square comic that I made after going to like a little show last year. I guess because I wanted to express that like there's this way in which certain songs like are a very powerful time capsule into who you used to be and like there's like this extended puberty that I feel that I'm still in even though I'm 26 and Mitski you know made an album called Puberty 2 and like it really speaks to me this kind of like um like nostalgia and fondness for your teenage years, even if some of the things you were going through at the time is traumatizing. So this like this is like a temp panel comic, but it's just about like going, singing the song. I like very dorkily went up to a bunch of people and were like, you look so cool. And they were like, okay. But it was just sort of this like nice feeling of being emo and like other people singing along to like Lincoln Park. Like it's not important, but for me, it felt important. Like it felt like this tiny moment of connection and catharsis after like a particularly depressing year. Uh, Gong Lurie or Kong Girl is like a digital comic that was rejected from several literary journals. And it's just this kind of exploration about the way that women are imaged in Hong Kong and the way that like 
I've just felt haunted by this like one particular um, visualization of how women should look in Hong Kong for like my whole life. So, and a gong lurry is kind of used derisively like in a misogynist way to like make fun of girls from Hong Kong or women from Hong Kong. And I was just trying to unpack like my many shades of internalized misogyny in this like little diary comic. Uh, Remembering Nancy Secchi is a comic I made recently. It's like a historical comic about this wonderful artist who was uh, kind of coming to prominence at the time of extreme media saturation in Japan in the 1990s. So I just loved her and I was like, Instead of just going on a Wikipedia hole, maybe I should make a comic about her. Uh, so I did. And okay, don't tell my publishers, but I'm just gonna show you some like sneaky, sneaky pages from a uh, cannot yet be named graphic novel, but it's a memoir about like queer coming of age and friendship. And basically the year I spent like coming out and thinking about how maybe friendship might be one of the greatest forms of romance and it's actually quite overlooked. So. It's a book about me talking to my friends and just hanging out with them and kind of coming into the feeling of like realizing, like having good friends feels like coming home no matter where you are, or where you have to go. Um, I'm excited about this book. It's the first time I'm using a lot of color and I'm getting, I'm using spot red and spot pink and I feel like I'm pushing myself in new directions, but I'm very slow and I feel very self-conscious about that sometimes, but making comics takes time. So if you wanna start making comics, please be nice to yourself about taking time because it's okay to take as much time as you need. Uh, that's all I really have to share tonight. I'm sorry, I talked like 13 minutes, but thank you everyone for listening and looking forward to Lee's sharing. Oh, this has been such a treat. Um, thanks everyone for making such wonderful presentations. I'm so sorry that mine is very lo-fi in comparison. Um, I wanna do a quick land acknowledgement because I'm on stolen land here. Um, I'm in Jiajage, which is colonially known as Montreal and it's, traditionally a meeting place for a bunch of First Nations, but it's understood that the Ganengahaka Mohawk people have been the caretakers of it and still are. Oh, I'm just gonna let more people into the waiting room. Okay, um, I'm gonna break the rules and talk for less time if I can, because I really wanna get to the discussion. You all are very smart. And uh, similarly, I feel like a lot of my stuff is on Google and Instagram. I deleted my Tumblr recently because they made it so that all the sexy stuff is gone anyway, which is very no fun. And even if there's nipples, it counts as sexy stuff, which is very boring. Oh, you have it. <laughs> That's so sweet. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Welcome to my desktop. Um, all right, this is, if I can make it work. Okay, this is my workspace. This is where I'm sitting right now, except it's the other side. Um, whoops, nope, okay. So I went to, I went to art school. Um, I did three years doing a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Australia and it was a profound waste of time. I think the main skill that I got from that experience was how to justify my work, um, which is, you know, not nothing. I think it's really helpful in creating a, a skills to articulate what you're doing um, and to have research methodologies, but for the most part, I didn't actually draw a lot in that time at all. I spent my whole childhood drawing and then I stopped and tried to make smart, clever, contemporary art work. And then I left and was like, fuck this, I'm going back to comics. And I've been making comics for like seven years since then. Um, for a while, as I was kind of figuring out how I wanted to draw, I was mostly making little vignette type comics like this. Um, lots of things where I would just let myself um, I do little zines and it was really helpful because they're super low stakes. You print like 20 of them and then you sell them for $5 and they're out in the world and you learn something from the experience. Um, so I did a lot of these things and figured out in that process that I really liked doing scenes where people are just walking around and talking. And a lot of my work is people just hanging out in a space and talking, um, which I thought would be a terrible bore for everybody, but it turns out a lot of people actually like reading that and I like reading that stuff. So it's okay if it's boring for some people. Um, after that, I like a few years ago now, I did this book that Caitlin was waving in front of the webcam before, which was called First Year. And it's about these two boys in the first year of their relationship. It's very, it's like a, you could read it in three minutes standing up in a bookstore. Um, I did a couple of short runs of this book and then it disappeared from Tumblr. I tried to keep it there for free to read and now it's nowhere at all. 
Um, but it was a really, really educational experience. I look at it now and all I see is all the mistakes, but that's just the permanent state of making work and you just have to deal with that, I think. Um, but it, it, finishing it was, it felt like an enormous triumph because I'd never finished anything that long before, even though it's only collectively like 110 panels or something like that, one page per panel. Um, but that enabled me to give writing graphic novel go. And through that process, I really figured out that long form is absolutely my thing. I really like creating long stories. It feels really decadent to be able to spend a couple hundred pages really stewing on certain characters and getting to know them. Um, like, I see if I can just, if you look at my screen or my camera, there's like a whole bunch of stickers on my wall. And that's all just me figuring out the current book I'm working on. Um, but to double back, the next book I ended up working on, or well, the first big book was called Stone Fruit. Um, it was such an incredible challenge. Uh, I look back at it now and again, all I see is the mistakes, but I'm really happy that I finished it. Um, <laughs> there's this thing that I experienced that I'm sure a lot of people who are comic makers mm -hmm. experience, a lot of people who make any work at all, of just the, the freeze of, of figuring out how to make something that isn't perfect. And as a queer artist, as a trans artist, and as someone who's mixed race in always been in Australia and Canada, where there is a perceived scarcity of Asian artists, of artists who are non-white or mixed race, like when there's not, there's actually an abundance of us, but, but because not a lot of them have been published um, or put into any kind of mainstream, there's like that, those parts of the identity are often focused on. And I think, one of the many sides of that is that there is a lot of pressure to make work that you can kind of stand behind and, and be a very assertive about your work in that way. And I don't want to be because I'm full of embarrassment about my work and I feel like I have the right to be. <laughs> but one thing that uh, a filmmaker that I really admire her work, her name's Desiree Akavan. She recently did The Miseducation of Cameron Post. She also did a really great film called Appropriate Behaviour. Um, but she talks a lot and really generously online, if you ever look at her talks on YouTube about uh, what it is to have a, you know, marginalized intersecting identity in an American context for her um, and be creating work that's kind of close to the bone and vulnerable. And she talked about advice that she would give to emerging creators, especially creators who are non-white or have any kind of marginalized identity to, um, to, to build skills around tolerating your own mediocrity. <laughs> which I thought was brilliant because I'm like, yeah, actually like the main skill I need is to just be able to commit to a project and finish it. And I will gain so much from that experience every single time. I gain so much from this book. Um, I'm gonna share this really cute photo that Caitlin sent me on Instagram the other day of a book club. It, I died, it was so nice. It's just like, it made the whole embarrassing process of putting a book out into the world entirely worth it to know that absolute cuties are reading it. Um, and it's also been a good jump stone for me to then work on this current project, which I'm probably not allowed to talk about much, but I don't care, I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, it's will eventually probably come out with Fanographics, maybe a year or two, whenever I can get myself to finish the pages, but it's called Canon. Um, it's about two, Canadian Chinese girls who have been friends since high school and they're entering their, you know, actual adulthood as opposed to young adulthood and trying to figure out whether their long-term friendship, which was sort of established in a time of scarcity and need as, you know, two Gaysians in a high school that's mostly a bunch of West Islanders, um, whether it's still relevant, whether they still like each other, even though they love each other. Um, and a lot of stuff around anger management too, just for more fun light things. Um, it's also gonna be, to keep it on topic if I can, like it's, it's gonna be the first time I'm trying to talk about neoliberalism and the ways that I think particularly in Canada, like definitely in Australia, but I've noticed it since I moved to Canada heaps, like there's a real, like, like neoliberalism in the arts is really intense here. Um, I think maybe the Trudeaus, like Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Justin Trudeau as the prime minister now, their focus on <clears throat> immigration, building the economy, like the way that capitalism has glommed onto migrant experience here. 
um, and how that manifests in the arts has been really interesting to watch and the way that it's affected how my career has gone. I think I've actually benefited from it a lot, especially in comics. Over here, the comic scene is extremely white um, and it blows my mind that people say things to me like, oh, you know, your work is about race. And I'm like, do you mean it has characters in it that aren't white? Because they're not the same thing. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's about like messy relationships, but it's very interesting. It's very revealing. Um, have I got any more slides here? Oh, this is just a picture of all my panels, uh, my pages on the floor. This is the same room that I'm sitting in now. And it's me figuring out my double spreads because I tend to not thumbnail until I've done the damn thing. And then I realize that the flow is either working or not working. So it's always kind of keeping me on my toes. Um, I think it's probably a grass is greener situation. Like I work almost entirely in traditional media. Um, and so I see work like, you know, like Caitlin's, well, like Kayla's and it's, it's amazing to me because it's digital and because of all the layers and the textures that you can create with digital work. But I think there's immense value to both. And it feels very abundant that we're all still quite young and we have honestly decades ahead of us of just drawing whatever the fuck we want for a long time um, and experimenting as much as we want. But anyway, that's all I want to talk about because uh, we had a little Google Doc to share before this talk to, sh to see all the things that we might talk about in relation to being Asian and being in comics. Um, and there's so many juicy things to potentially debate or just agree upon. And I want to get to that. So I'm going to hand it back and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thanks for sharing. It was all, all of the presentations are so great. And um, it was so lovely to see um, all the um, processes behind the scenes that Caitlin's um, influences and your inspirations were also lovely to share and made me regret I didn't put more of my inspo into them. Um, and Lee, you talked about like all the themes that were recurring and what would be happening in the future and what was in the past. And um, Jason, you mentioned your previous works and how sort of some really menacing comments you've been through. And I think actually all of us share a really sort of similar um, view on how when we talk about Asian comics, the point is that it's not that, the point is that it isn't the point, is that it's not just about being Asian. And that was the goal of the talk as well, as um, that is, it's not just about the word Asian. Um, so, I've actually prepared a slide with just like discussion questions, but I feel like we can also go through like the Google Notes thing, um, see what you guys think. Um, feel free to turn on your mics, like um, Lee, Katlin, and Jason, feel free to turn on your mics now. Um, so. Start with the slides, I think, because the, the doc is very cool, but it's quite dense. So maybe we need to like warm up. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, maybe let me just get to the, th there was one slide like this one that I prepared. Maybe it's a good starter. Um, so I'll just read all of them out and um, and then we can just start pretty much anywhere or just start not from these at, uh, at all, could be something else. Um, so what are some recurring themes that you address in visual storytelling. How has your background or upbringing changed the way you approach comics? But I feel like we kind of mentioned that already. Um, on the dangers of self-tokenization, which was um, a talk that Caitlin did with, is it Glasgow Zine Library? Um, was very inspiring. Um, what are some challenges telling or depicting Asian stories in English? And what are some limitations of the term Asian comics? Is it over representing or under representing? Okay. Can I start with something? Yes. I would love to ask you three wonderful artists about how you stylize and depict uh, faces that happen to be Asian. Because I think, you know, there's a long legacy in terms of certain eye shapes. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we, I don't even want to have to say it, but it's just, yeah. And it makes me think, like, uh, Jason mentioned really wanting to draw uh, 
Asian protagonists after receiving certain like shitty racist feedback. And Lee, I think you mentioned another talk that someone gave you feedback about like, was it peanut eyes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, and I was yeah. like, but it's like, but your eyes feel like real? Like I, you, <laughs> you have very stylized figures and yet they feel like wonderfully Asian in different ways. And then Kayla, you have these really like sometimes wonderful, like grotesque, really like psychedelic figures. And I like the way that you you are, you are all willing to go to these different places because sometimes it feels like, this is so petty, but sometimes I'm afraid of making Asian people look like stereotypes or like ugly because there already is so much of that out there. Um, but that's just something I've struggled with because I have like 12 Asian characters in my graphic novel and I have to make them all look very distinctive. Um, but anyways, maybe we can do like a round robin mic like Kayla, Jason Lee. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is actually something I'm like thinking about very frequently, like almost every time I d make up a new character or if I'm just drawing. Um, because yes, it's especially in my work, I do a lot of um, caricature and um, sort of distorting the face to an extent that you can very clearly tell that they might not be Asian or they are, and I'm sort mm -hmm. of making fun of some of the tropes. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I do feel like whether if I'm um, sort of representing them in a light that they should be. Um, however, I think um, my attempt through that is also to try represent them in a way that they haven't been done before. Um, and also in a way that it's not stereotypically that Asians have to look exactly this way. And I was also hoping, for example, with my current comic to represent Asian characters that are not just 20 something years old and very young and very um, typically um, sort of has a really small face and big eyes, which is very often the portrayal in manga and anime. Um, I'm pretty sure that in out of our common shared works that the characters we portray are imperfect and they might have um, some sort of personal issues and, and they might be middle-aged or they, they um, are not just um, like a very perfect character. So I think um, um, it's very hard to sort of juggle if there was a line of um, sort of it being offensive or borderline racist and it being sort of um, representative. Um, even though from the beginning, I wasn't planning to sort of have the perfect representation of uh, an Asian character. Um, and also just a side remark that um, I've had a comment, received a comment previously that someone read some of the pages of my comic and then um, sort of commented that, oh, this character looks white and this character looks um, Asian or Chinese or Japanese. And that was kind of weird for me to receive that comment because I wasn't actually thinking of um, the race of the characters in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. What mattered for me more was um, more of how their personalities shown through their appearances more than the race. Yeah. So yeah, that was just a, a mini thing I certainly remembered off my head. Um, so yeah, what, what do you guys think? Um, so if I may, I think I, I share the same um, kind of idea with you as well. When I create characters, I don't really think about um, how Asian this character is. I kind of have to focus on you know their personalities, what they're going through and stuff and I think when I draw for example for the boy I just I model after myself and I, that's the thing I quite often do to avoid kind of like negative de de depiction or like you know representing re like the problem with representation and um, so like the the topics I usually um, discuss or you know like express through my work are quite emotional and I just I want to make it as universal as possible so often I just you know, I mo quite often I cover up the face um, in my illustrations. They kind of 
most of the time they are like cover up with something else or they merge or they transform into something. And I think that's kind of subconsciously my way of avoiding um, the you know stereotypes of depiction, but rather than the emotional side of um, the um, yeah the what, what I'm trying to say basically um, yeah. I think it's like, for me, as with a lot of things, it's been really helpful to um, know the history of certain things. Like the history of comics is fascinating. Like the way that semiotics and comics have created the visual language that we understand. There's all these shorthands now that you can use. Um, I really benefited from Scott McCloud's making comics works to, to learn about you know how comic gutters created a certain kind of sequential storytelling. Um, but also I remember when I was in school looking into the history of how different people of color have been represented in comics and how often that's come from really intense racial agenda um, or like racist agendas. And, you know, coming from Australia, there was a gold rush and the yellow peril shit was so intense. And so how Asians looked in editorials and in newspaper cartoons was there was a really intense visual language that was entirely racist around how you could identify an Asian person in just a few lines. Um, and so in that sense, I wanted to be hyper aware of that to not fall into certain harmful tropes. But at the same time, it feels important to kind of, at some point divorce myself from thinking about what white people think <laughs> of, of the comics and of my work in general. Um, like it's never been difficult receiving feedback from other Asians and other queer folks and other trans folks. I feel like a lot of the, the stuff that really gets me tying my brain in pretzels is like wacky feedback from white people. And that's just, my stories are not for that audience. And then like, I make my work for me and, um, it's like this funny balance between wanting to wanting to be really tapped into how my work is going to be received and also just wanting to make it for the sake of making it. Um, and so trying to find that line of not overly considering the influence that it's that the work is going to have when I put it out there. Like, I don't frame my work as educational. Um, even though perhaps maybe it might be for some folks like Recently, I read this book called Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. It's brilliant. If anyone likes reading regular fiction, it's it's a treat. Um, but it was really um, it was really really exciting to read a book about trans folks that doesn't really give non trans readers anything. <laughs> like doesn't really throw them a bone at any point. It's kind of just leaping in to the deep end. And as someone who's trans and has been trans for like a decent amount of time now, like most of my adult life, it was so refreshing to just be like, oh, wow, I don't have to sift through 20 pages of someone explaining to me what cisgendered means. I can just go straight to the drama of these people and all the gossip that they're creating in this story. And that's really great. Um, and I think it's really exciting to see Asian stories that aren't like a 101 about the Asian experience, because I think stories, because of this perceived scarcity, often end up being like filling this responsibility to be a 101 when like they can just be an enjoyable story. They can just be uh, a surrealist experience or an experience of caricature or texture um, or like, you know, a queer coming of age thing it doesn't have to be about that. But at the same time, I really enjoy the fact sometimes that my work is pigeonholed because then it makes it more e easy to find for Asians who are looking to see their work or to see someone making work that is has characters that are Asian. Um, Kaylin, I want to hear what you have to think about this to finish the round table. I also just want to say, I don't mean to keep calling on you last. I was just following the speaker. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love being last. <laughs> okay. um, it's really silly, but today I was trying to draw a character who's very happy and they're so happy, you know, their like eyes are pretty much closed. But then when I did it, I just couldn't make it not look like some weird like food mascot thing. And then it made me think about like all the, yeah, inherited visual culture that like lives in my head about 
um, like flattened simple Asian. Something so interesting is that like there's such a strong graphic history in East Asian art history. And yet we talk about like theoretically wanting characters to be dimensional. So that's one thing that I love about comics is like, how can you try in 2D to draw people who feel so like they have a backstory and like they're very textual and embodied. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just like trying to not, yeah, like worry about unflatteringness. Cause it's like, that shouldn't even be a thing when you're just trying to write a story is like unflattering characters because none of us are like constantly flattered in life. But at the same time, uh, I guess there's, there's less of a scarcity when let's say like there's like 12 queer Asian people in my book. So it's not as if like making one that has mistakes is gonna make all the queer Asians look so bad. It's like, there's just too many. Or like, yeah, I kind of get to the point where like, I don't know, I was talking to my editors about like one of the butch Asian characters and it's like, which one? And it's like, I can't believe I'm at a point where we can have multiple characters when like, I don't know, like in my family background, like women were not even like allowed to read like two generations ago. So when I think about that like privilege, I just think like, I cannot waste this chance, even though like, I'm just like one person, like who cares? Like at the same time, it's also kind of like the, the chance to get to make comics and like just wanting to, like all of you have spoken to, like take it and challenge yourself and take it in a new direction makes me want to just think like, I can waste like half an hour right now, like stressing about this like happy Asian person with closed eyes because people, you know, close their eyes to make fun of Asians. Or I can just like let them be happy because even my fictional character deserves a moment of joy in this like overall pretty emo book. So yeah. I guess it's just like things about like weird conversations you have with yourself when you're at the drawing board for like five hours. Totally, totally. Also, it's just, it's nice to have many panels to do a thing, like to show a character on every angle. Like if I'm worrying about like, oh my God, I'm falling into the trope of doing this person with a super flat face because they happen to look like that on this one angle. It's like, okay, I have like 400 other panels to draw them on every angle imaginable with every facial expression. And hopefully I, I will trust in my readers to be able to contain those multitudes as they read. <laughs> I think that's one thing about comics too, is that um, with that many, you have a breadth of space to work with. Um, you have characters who can be multi-dimensional. They could mm -hmm. be doing one thing in one scene and another thing in another. Um, I also have a question to throw, to throw out at everyone else is um, regarding, um, I was thinking about languages. So if you are to mention um, something of the other language that is in a probably primarily English text in your work, how would you do so? Um, would you sort of reference it or have it as an inherent part of your work? And also I might just stop sharing the screen so that like it might feel more like a conversation. Okay. It's tricky. <laughs> like navigating non non-English language when publishing with an English publisher is like this um like it's very thorny. And I think there's something beautiful about silence too. It's, I mean maybe I don't sorry. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of silence in a lot of your work, especially I think in Jason's work and in Lee's work, there's many silent panels, like situation panels that are espousing a lot of context, both spatially and in terms of rooms and stuff. And it kind of makes me think about how things don't need to be over explained. The, the negative space and the, the lack of speaking says a lot, right? And then similarly, I try to apply the attitude towards language too. Like before this talk, Vivian was kind of sharing with me how one of their favorite scenes in Stone Fruit has like, <laughs> this is the last time I'm gonna mention Stone Fruit, enough after this for me. For me. Um, like uh, two of the main characters like getting into bed and then there's like a window scene after. That's just so, it just says what you need to say and there doesn't need to be an over explanation of what's this window scene and which bedroom is it and who is it? It's like, whatever, like, it's just chef's kiss. And then I think if we can allow ourselves to do that with like multiple languages, that's what I'm trying to do with the Cantonese and Mandarin dialogue in my book, because some of you who are familiar with those languages know that Cantonese and Mandarin aren't even the same language, right? And also like Taiwanese is also a separate language and part of my book takes place in Taiwan. So it's just like, um, I have to have these little subtitles. And at first I really worried about them because they're kind of weird. Like, I think translation is always weird. Like in Cantonese, some some parents refer to daughters as alari, like a girl, but like, I don't know, it's, it's like, 
I was talking to a friend who's non-binary about how sometimes a lawyer can sometimes be endearing and not feel like misgendering, even though the tra transliteral thing is like girl. It just like a lawyer is not always a girl. If you are like a queer person who loves your parents and maybe are non-binary and you don't see it that way, some people do, but some people don't. So just those kind of of language, I think, are worth leaving unexplained if possible. Like if you have a publisher who will accept you on that journey, it's a good feeling to not have to be like, this Cantonese phrase of like blah, 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 history. Like, like it's gonna pull someone out of the book. I don't know, that's what I think. But maybe I wanna hear from other panelists. Um, yeah, I, the canon, the book I'm working on now, it has a relationship between the main character, Canon, and her, her grandfather. And they talk in English and Chinese. And I, I was raised monolingual, like my, my dad's first generation from Hong Kong and my mom's born in Australia and is white. And that was a very prickly decision that they made when we were younger to not raise us with Chinese because at the time, Australia doesn't look very fondly upon folks with any kind of accent. Um, but now me and my sister are in this process of very slowly and very painfully learning Cantonese, um, which in the context of being in Canada is quite tricky, but luckily I still have a lot of Cantu speaking folks around me here to practice very clumsily with. Um, and I, I wanted to use this book as an opportunity to try and put some of what I'm learning into, into the dialogue that they're having. But then also I'm learning in the Yutping system, which is one of the Romanized ways of, of spelling out Cantonese. But for a, a native, for many native speakers, they're just like gonna look at the words and be like, what the fuck is that? Which feels really wrong to me. So I was like, okay, maybe then I use characters, but then people like are just gonna skip over that. And then I was like, that's fine. If someone can't speak it, maybe it can just be there for someone who understands it and it doesn't actually need like as long as the story doesn't hinge on this piece of dialogue which probably it doesn't um it can just be a breadcrumb for a very specific group of readers in the same way that like I don't know I put trans people in my comics all the time and I don't say what kind of gender they are and like we don't actually talk about their experience and that's fine like it can just be there for a trans reader to be like okay great like this person is probably experiencing this but we don't actually know um and I think yeah, feeling like trying to release the sense of like uh, extreme responsibility of like needing to explain and justify every creative decision I'm going to make uh, feels like a ongoing process. <laughs> Jason, I want to hear from you. It's a quite a tricky question for me because um, I think a lot of my work, you probably can notice there's a lack of words in my sequential work, especially. Um, I think um, as a storyteller, I just want to give enough information to get my message across, but leave a lot of rooms for the audience to speculate, um, especially with my first book, The Boy. Um, it's mostly wordless, except some um, piece of writing like here and there. And the purpose of that was to, because it's basically about the boy and his imagination. I wanted the, and also, um, as I said, in the end, um, his imagination takes over and he kind of disappears in the end of the book. And the pub, like my idea was that um, I left all the clues, they're all like embedded within the stories. And it's up to the audience to go back to the story like again and again to find um, all the clues. Um, I saw really interesting in the idea of like um, puzzles and I, I like, like unpacking things and that's kind of the uh, like, kind of um, idea kind of sprung through most of my work, to be honest, and I don't, I haven't really written uh, much stories that require, you know, my first language or, you know, stuff like that. So I think I'm not a good person to answer this question. Yeah, sorry to disappoint. I mean, I think that's a really good answer in and of itself. Like we've talked a lot about silences. Um, when I saw your, I haven't seen scenes from your comic the boy before um but i think i wrote it in the chat before like i don't know if any of you have read sean tan's work before he's a illustrator based in australia as well and he wrote this book about the experience oh exactly thank you caitlin just so onto it <laughs> but his is also like there's no dialogue in it but it's one of the most emotionally profound books i've read and it conveys so much of the of the kind of cultural shock 
of being in a different place and trying to make a community there um, that's so incredible. Oh, what a beautiful book. But that's, yeah, the silences in that book really speak volumes. Can I ask something? Sorry. <laughs> like, like, can I ask a question to y'all generally? Because I feel very sparked. Is that okay, Kayla? Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to ask you about fantasy because, uh, you know, a lot of people associate Asian cultures with different mythology and folklore. And one thing that I think is very fantastical about all three of your work is that you're willing to, you know, actually, because that's the thing I've always struggled with, like being a very like schooly Asian who just like tried to draw things that really exist. It was like an art teacher who actually had to tell me like, you know, you can draw things that like aren't here, right? And I was just like, okay, like, I don't know. I'm very simple in that way. So I just thinking about, you know, those amazing faces, Kayla, and, and those foods that don't exist, but they I feel like they should exist in Mickey Mouse hands. And I love the way that Jason, it feels like you're collapsing space and rooms and objects and scale. Like you have some things that feel like they should be very small and you draw them very large. And that's like so satisfying for some reason, <laughs> like the small person and the big thing. And like, um, I could have to mention Strong Fertigran. In Lee's book, there are characters that transform and like take on non-human forms. So it would be great to hear from you about fantasy. Um, yeah, I guess we'll do the same order. So it's like not awkward. I don't know, Kayla. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. I think especially um, um, the recent the recent Marvel film Shang Chi was also originally a comic, a Marvel comic. Um, I haven't read the original comic at all, but um, like I can imagine the association with with Asian storytelling sometimes it would always involve a dragon and a phoenix and like um, like um, what else like just like gods and like um, a necklace that connects you to your heritage. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The jade necklace. Um, all of these motifs are are absolutely very common, um, and I think that's why um, when it comes back to our work or like the work we can currently explore, um, I was definitely trying not to do those things. I was trying to look for, I guess, a more modern take of. Um, if even if my story might be surreal, for example, um, how would it be? And also just by the way that like also because Caitlin, your comics are so you have done research behind them and it's always very like informative and just really satisfying. And then um, I guess then on my side that I'm kind of not that good with research, but just good at just imagining things um randomly um and I think I got my I tend to get inspiration from really strange places um and really weird images from the internet um such as um one of the characters who has this really sharp head um like this really like chiseled head actually got inspiration from like an internet figure um like maybe like a few years ago who was sort of like a KOO, like a key opinion influencer who had his like plastic surgery done and he has like these very sharp chin and these very big eyes. Um, and um, he was nicknamed by the media as, um, was it like Zeng Lam, like, um, like a snake serpent um, guy and he actually does look quite weird because I see I can, if I can find the photo later, um, because he he did plastic surgery and he just looks um, like the wrong the wrong Barbie doll or Kevin doll to be honest. And I think actually the way that the media calls him as a serpent person, um, now now that I think about it, is actually quite a fantastical figure, but just. Um, in the modern world and, and social, seen in social media too. Um, so I think, um, yeah, yeah. So I tend to find strange um, inspiration in different places and just trying not to 
go back to the jade necklace and the and all those other things um, because I think there's actually much more room to play with other things even if it's vaguely tying back into a certain culture it doesn't mean it has to be that very sort of traditional um, way of doing it. Um, I think for me um, growing up my parents been really busy but what they did is they bought me a lot of um, like books like illustrated uh, children's book and they're often quite like fantastical and like myths and like contemporary um, interpretation of like old stories as well and when I was in um, I think the turning point of how my works kind of went kind of to a surreal direction is when I was 10 year old I remember distinctly um, I was in the art class in Taiwan and um, my art teacher showed us like Rene Magritte and that was the first time that I saw like surreal kind of imageries apart from the traditional you know drawing um, like nature scenery sea ocean sunset all that kind of things and then that kind of um, clicked with me and then I think it's also the rebellious nature of my you know like younger years I tend to not want to do things as they should be done so yeah as I said I was in the art class so we had lessons you know tr trying to draw like um, depict you know like life drawings trying to depict um, still lives like perfectly and trying to use colors as that should be used. And I remember one time we were supposed to draw eyes. And then I made a bird out of the eye. So basically the eyes, the head, and I just drew a little bird um, body and the legs and like human legs. And then I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna do it whatever. I know the teacher's gonna be you know pissed about it, but I don't care. You know, I don't wanna do what everybody's doing. But then uh, to my surprise, um, I was praised highly for what I did. And then that was such a big encouragement and turning point for me. Like I can basically do what, what I want and it's like creativity is something to be cherished. And and um, since then, you know, and also one really key uh, thing for me is um, the Courage the Cowardly Dog. I don't know if you guys know uh, the cartoon. It's uh, one of my favorite cartoons, even, even till now. Um, so as I said, my parents were really busy. Um, when I was younger and they uh, sometimes they let me stay over like um, stay longer you know when it's supposed to be my bedtime and the courage the cowardly dog I usually come like really late on Cartoon Network <laughs> during those, those kind of times and that's the kind of like cartoon that I, I could watch during that time and that was like used to scare shit out of me but also it opened my mind in a, in a really bizarre way and um, I think from then I just kind of um, got really into the kind of dream world and the in-between, you know, um, crossover between reality and fantasy. And that's kind of what I situate myself and my practice within. And it's been there ever since because that's kind of my, how my visual language developed naturally. And that's how, um, it's kind of like my worldview now and how I see things with the lens and, um, also in my presentation, as I mentioned, I keep a visual diary and sometimes it's just like scribble. You can't even see what it's about, but after a few days when I look back to at them, I can see things from them and just, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's my experience, I guess, yeah. It's funny, Caitlin, that you said that you're very schooly and that like, mostly your stuff is rooted in realism because I feel exactly the same <laughs> like I'm glad in this situation that I went last because I'm like I don't fucking know how to talk about this but um yeah like the, the, the one I'm working on now I love magical realism especially in fiction um but it feels like the most difficult thing like I'm really in awe of of work that bends reality in the ways that you know like you're really doing in your work Jason and Kayla too like that that kind of really warpy caricature and and like complete departure from like realism in moments and then bringing it back to it at the same time is so impressive to me and so difficult um but I think it's like kind of you just fake it until you make it like <laughs> 
I, I in the the characters in Stone Fruit when they when they shape shift was just an enormous experiment. Um, but I think a lot of uh, my interest in in fantasy in that sense kind of came from being obsessed with the Studio Ghibli films, which I'm sure other people here also had their big moment. Um, I grew up being less interested in a lot of fantasy and sci-fi stuff because it didn't have a richness in relational things and characters in the way that I really wanted. Like, like Lord of the Rings, every character is kind of boring. Like they're kind of cool in what they can do, but no interesting character development in those stories. Just, they just walk for hundreds of pages and there's weird languages and the world building is really clever, but I'm not invested in anybody and I want to be invested in the people that I'm meeting in these stories. And so I think like, it was really nice coming into my late teens and twenties and finding a wonderful marriage of of characters that I that felt really vivid and really engaging and interesting to me, then also pushing and bending reality at the same time. And so that feels like an interesting challenge over the next 10 years, I guess, to reintegrate and reacquaint myself with fantasy and sci-fi as incredible storytelling tools um, while trying to keep the things I've learned about character building and, and realism like bringing those two together. Yeah. Caitlin, is that like, what, how are you, what's your relationship to realism now? Like, cause you're doing a coming of age story now, like, or maybe you finished it by now, eh? Like, is that something that's interesting to you to explore in the future? Or is it just something that's satisfying to consume? Cause I don't think, you know, everything has to enter our work in that way. Mm. The way you just said, A hey, really reminds me of my mom. She's really <laughs> <laughs> also effortless transition like that was such a good like talking transition uh I feel as if one of the things I struggled with is spot color because I have to make everything red and pink uh, or black and I this is so like uncool but like I was drawing a swimming pool and I was like should the pool be pink and then my friend was like yeah and I colored it like a bit red and I was like what do you think and it's like it's like a pool of blood and I was like that's not the vibe though so I think <laughs> there's, there's sort of like ways in which the technical constraints of making a graphic novel are sort of making me lend my imagination more heavily. And um, I'm just trying to like get better at imagining. I, I, Cause I think, uh, I know it takes imagination to transform your life into work. Like one thing I always wanna resist is when like certain marginalized creators are acted as if they're just transcribing their life. Like there's such a intense process of transformation that I see all of you taking your experiences into your work. Um, but at the same time, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid of imagining because similarly like Lee growing up a lot of I didn't read any like sci-fi or fantasy even though it was like the most popular thing um you know it's all it's on all the bookstores and they have all the flashy covers and I guess animorphs was kind of cool for some reason I could relate more to to humans that were transforming into animals than like dragon kids and like cat kids like I don't know what was wrong with me but I think yeah I just I want there to be like a relational heft and like tension between what's happening between people because I think from when I was younger, I'm like, what is happening around the people around me? The tension between my parents and my friends is so intense and there's no one to talk to about it. So comics is a nice way to see relationships unfold and they don't have to be heavy. Like, I think there's beautiful, small, poignant moments in relationships that can be explored that doesn't have to feel like it's a drama. Like, I don't feel like all like comics that are about relationships are about drama. They can also be about like dogs or hobbies or all kinds of things. So I'm just trying to, I guess, maybe find the fantasy in everyday boring things because I'm copping out. Um, it's 11.36, I guess. I don't know if, like, in the interest of respecting everyone's time, if some people have to go now, like, in the palace, or I could go on for, like, another 10, 15 minutes. Um, I think if we're kind of, we did quite a lot of free discussion now, would you guys be open to opening Q&A? And yeah, maybe, um, yeah. if, um, let's see how we should do this. Um, if someone wants to ask a question in person, open their mic, they can raise their hands. Or if you're not comfortable, just comment in the chat. And um, yeah. Oh, Cal, would you like to turn on your camera and speak? Or just speak? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, no, I'm a bit shy to turn on my camera. OK, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, great. Um, so actually, um, I'm from Southeast Asia. So this whole discussion on, say, feelings of um, self-tokenization 
diaspora, it is a little bit distant from um, like the conversations that we tend to engage with. Because example, I've never been out of Singapore. I mean, I've never been out of Asia. So um, I'm not really very familiar with the discourses of say, how it feels to be displaced and how to negotiate a kind of double identity in a sense. So um, if you are comfortable with doing so, um, would you mind speaking um, and to any artist? Yeah. Um, would you mind speaking more on say how you personally negotiate um, this kind of, okay. So example, I'm an Asian artist. I do not want to tokenize myself, but I understand that I do have to kind of like example, um, make a living. So I do need a kind of diverse audience of people to example, support me financially and buy my things. It can't just be like a very niche audience. Yeah, I'm, I'm not very sure how to put this across. Yeah. Thank you for your question, firstly. It's a good question. Six cuts to share. Do you want to start, Lee, or should I go? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think there is uh, a way in which I feel uh, also a little uh, geographically strange, having spent like almost all my life in Hong Kong, um, but having one parent who's Asian Australian, so feeling like I have this access to like what is perceived as Western culture, and being told often that I'm a Western Asian makes me feel as if perhaps I am not qualified to speak to any of your experiences, Cal. Um, but I appreciate the way that you're asking about uh, the tension between uh, the things you want to say and do in your wildest, most unhinged imaginations and the machinations of your daily life and also trying to fit your art into maybe a publishing industry or an art industry. And uh, I struggle when young artists ask me about this often because it feels like I don't want to tell them that the art industry kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> but there, there are things about it that are inherently self-destructive. and. Um, I don't believe that I'm qualified to offer advice, but I, I would just like to say that I think um, your experiences are obviously enormously valuable. Like, because one spends one life in one place, it doesn't mean their experience is like one thing. Like, I, I'm sure that, you know, your experiences in Singapore, which is a place, you know, fraught with like a lot, a lot of different historical tensions and, um, you know, different overlapping cultures. I mean, you, you know, obviously because you're from there, um, there's so much richness and, um, possibility, and as you said, diversity in your stories that could be explored. So I hope that you feel that you're in a position to um, harness what feels true about your experience and, and trying to balance the, maybe the multiple voices in your head about, oh, what's going to be like popular in Singapore? Or like, what do you think people want to know about Singapore? Like, that's sometimes why I think about Hong Kong when I make my work, but um, I don't feel like that's your responsibility. Um, but I appreciate you sharing your thoughts about this talk and the angle that we took. And thanks. Um, that was the perfect answer, I think. I don't have, I can, I, I have a thing to add on to that, but I feel like I just want to echo everything you said um, and just add that I like, I think there is that uh, the kind of existential wonderings about how to make work, just the, the, the ambiguity of it and the, the dilemmas of it just increase the more money that is involved for me. Um, when I was making work and like, I was just working in kitchens and paying all my bills from doing kitchen work and making comics on the side. And that was a very chill time. I could just make whatever I wanted and I could work as slow as I wanted. And since comics has been my main form of income, which is, or my only form of income, which has been the last five years, I think, um, the dilemma of like, what responsibility do I have? How do I represent myself? How do I resist tokenization? How do I want my work to be consumed? All these kind of unpleasant questions and also very interesting and rich questions have been coming up more and be more preoccupying. And I just feel the more that like my work and capital and capitalism and the more that like, you know, there's publishers and other people with jobs relying on my work doing well to get money of their own those kinds of things has been have like have made it more complicated and I just think that money in general makes things more complicated and makes um makes it hard to work with integrity in the same way and I don't think there's an easy 
answer to that. I think it's as complex as being like, okay, how do I live in a city ethically? How do I live on colonized land ethically? Like, it's just, I don't think there's easy answers, but I think they're really interesting conversations and things to be uh, suspicious of and self-critical of and like suspicious of other people, but also just to continue on and not close that discussion. Yeah. That's such an insightful add-on, Lee. Thank you for that. Um, as, a, as a relatively early artist, I think that really resonates as well, hearing from both Caitlin and Lee that I've also, I'm also learning from your answers. And also that um, I think feeling displaced is something that would just hold on, that, that it wouldn't disappear, like the feeling of displacement once it's there. And there's not really, I don't think there's ever a way, at least for me to be getting rid of that feeling, having been, for example, myself being in London right now and but having lived my life in Hong Kong and sort of, um, and as you've said, sort of addressing my own identity when I have to introduce myself to others and, and whether, um, who would I have to cave to do and all these things. Yeah, but um, I think that's, also a sense of displacement that would enrich someone's work in a kind of a weird way because it's not a good thing, but also, yeah. Um, should I head on to the next question, if that's okay? Um, Vivian, would you like to talk? Hello. <laughs> it's so, uh, thank you so much for all of your presentations. It's so nice to see um, friends and friends of friends and um, people who've made um, work that I'm just so enamored by, like be on a panel together, it's, it's amazing. Um, I'd really love to ask you all about the different forms that your comics take. Um, so um, some of you have mentioned like collaborative zines, um, the, the influences maybe of printing and printmaking and maybe even also the fair itself, you know, Hackney comics fair like I'd love to hear you talk about you know how that maybe changes the way you make or the way that you think about you know where sort of your work sits in this world like outside of this like capitalistic or maybe you know toying with what what you um um where it sits inside of this like capitalist system <laughs> Jason you want to start um, kind of zoomed out for a bit. Uh, so your question was about um, how the different form of comic influences um, how we uh, create, was it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess for you, it's like the sanitizer, I loved sanitizer on toast. Um, I thought it was really <laughs> fun. And um, yeah, like how that might have like shifted how you make. Right. So um, I think me personally, um, my work has always been quite, you know, like um, introspective and, and, and stuff. And for Sanitize on Toes, we basically, um, it was just between, we started as a conversation me, between me and my friend, we are just sitting in lockdown, you know, it was the beginning and was quite depressed, like, but nothing to do. And, and she was like, oh, maybe we should um, make something. You know out of the situation and then um so it became a discussion of how we're gonna approach um this um yeah this this collaborative um kind of ideas and then we came out with the idea of a uh, collect collaborative um zine and then later on um we added we ask uh, ask around and people would like you know happy to join us and yeah so uh, how is different from my usual practices um, I became kind of like the curator as, as, as much as an artist and we just kind of just have to um, talk about um, a lot of things. So it's not just about myself anymore. It's about kind of like a collective um, experience and how we can um, make it. Well, obviously it's about our individuals, but also, you know, it's a shared experience and um, that's a very different um, kind of approach to how I how I, I would usually create and we basically sit on 
well, we had a few rules for each each of us, but basically we, yeah, we had discussions over Zoom and stuff, and then, and then yeah, the final product is, uh, yeah, as you can see, it's like we everybody has a two page comic and, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Kayla, do you want to speak to the process of drawing your comic digitally but conceiving it as a print book? Because the design of your book feels really thoughtful and the size and everything is very nice. Oh, thanks again, Caitlin, for giving me that um, um, positive push. Um, I think, I think um, actually it's my first time it's also a book I'm trying to self-publish, by the way, and it's also the first time I've been trying to make a small press book that would be uh, 300 copies for now. Um, and it's quite a lot, um, but it's only been because I've been involved in um, Zine Coop in Hong Kong, for example. They had a show and tell party um, and also I wasn't really that involved in, but was always following. Um, there's like art book fair um, in Hong Kong. There's printed matter book fair in New York, and they had a really great um, digital book fair last year. And there was also a Tokyo art book fair. So there's all of these really amazing book fairs, which when I attended, just as a part, uh, as a not as a person exhibiting, but just as the the audience, the participant felt like there was a really welcoming and supportive collaborative atmosphere. And I would recommend anyone to go check them out the following, the coming year. Um, and it was through making zines and sharing them and um, sort of, um, yeah, just sharing them and talking about them and seeing what other people are doing uh, was really fun. And I think that was pretty much the sort of like um, a big push for me to sort of um, make, try to make a book myself. Um, and, um, and I think um, it's in particular that through trying to publish my own book that I guess I'm also trying to address how I would distribute it, which is also a major thing in publishing is that publishing is collaborative and you would always have to work with other people to get it through and um having the advantage like obviously i have to do everything but but the upside for that would be that i could consider where to distribute them and have the choice for where i want them to be which is actually very similar to um how zines work um so i think um doing the zines and and sort of was actually just essentially what I was doing throughout the majority of my life was just trying to get something done, like trying to have a story written out and then think it's great. Like I have to think, I have to agree that it's great, like have enough self-confidence to then promote it. And like, until like afterwards, maybe after a year, you'll be like, uh, probably it's a bit, um, it's a bit tacky at that time now that I look back at it, but but oh, there's always like that push of um, like energy that like drives you through each project. And I think that's very important, especially um, that when you're involved in different communities. So yeah. And yeah, that the champion engineering work thing is so real. The like pretend like you are your biggest fan for this moment of promoting the book. It's like, it's very formative, eh? Mm. Um. Was was someone named Natyada wanting to raise their hand? I'm not sure if you still want to ask something. It's okay if you don't anymore. Hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi. I had this question um, of like vulnerability, like drawing stories, because um, like Jason and you, Caitlin, like your stories are like you're portraying yourself. And I was just like wondering also for um, both others, like mm, what is like your strategies or boundaries or what is like a voice in your head that helps you to 
like encourage you to put these stories out because a lot of times I feel like I'm struggling like sharing this stuff um, because of like being paranoid of like people associate, associating my story too much with my personal life and I want to keep it more anonymous and stuff and I'm like I have other friends who like um, designing characters that don't really look like them but they are still telling their a personal story and I was like wondering what drives you to put them out and be like this vulnerable um, and I don't know everybody has a different approach but I was just wondering how both I like how all of you um, find your own way navigating this um just FYI Natia this work is beautiful everyone <laughs> The work on Instagram is so cool. Um, anyway, I like I'll, I can answer this quickly. I think like honestly, a lot of cognitive dissonance for me of just pretending like no one's actually going to look at it. <laughs> like especially with the last book, just finishing it and not thinking so hard, trying so hard not to think about who is going to look at it and what they're going to think. Um, it's been very helpful for me. Um, but yeah, like I. I think that a lot of my own influences and my, my own experiences have really informed how I write stories and the kinds of characters I write, but also I'm pretty um, explicitly writing fiction and I often like frame my work as fiction. Um, and I think if I was not writing fiction, I would expire. I don't know how people are brave enough ever to do autobio. It blows my mind that people can draw little versions of themselves like doing the thing. I, it's amazing. And I really love reading books like that, but I could never do it. I'm too embarrassed. Um, and so fiction for me is a way of um, creating this kind of avatar to, to, to let them feel things that I have felt before or experience similar things. Um, and honestly, we all know that like fiction can be just as emotionally intense as writing autobio stuff or memoir. Like it's still the same level of vulnerability, but I think it's whatever works for the creator. Like some people find it really easy to write, to, to create a little avatar of themselves that still looks like them and just play that fiction out in a different way. Cause it's all storytelling at the end of the day. And I think the vulnerability hangover has been really intense for me whenever I put something out into the world. And then I realized that like I wrote something super candid and then it's pe there's people reading it. But I think sharing and making work public has been an incredibly educational and formative part of my work for the past few years um and the learning experience of sharing it is worth the horrifying embarrassment of of, of sharing it <laughs> anyway i'm curious to hear what everyone else has to say um i think for me i've just been kind of uh or sometimes you can call it like ruthless sometimes when I put out work um, about myself. Like usually my illustrations are mostly to do with how I feel, but the way I do it is I package it in a way that is presented as um, what well, some, like most of the time my face is covered or my body is, you know, like not entirely in the frame. And um, in terms of my narrative work um, with the boy, so as I said, it's about the, the boy, uh, well, it, it was inspired by my time spent in the military where I was feeling really trapped and feeling really, really depressed. Um, I kind of wrote, I, the, the, the story came to me and then I was having these kind of surreal episodes where I would drift off, you know, just like when we were marching and my head would be like somewhere else. And I had the basic, uh, construction of the story and when I came back to the UK um, I decided to um, kind of modify the story a little bit um, because the core of the story is about you know being trapped in this place and doing things that you're not you know necessarily willing to do and agreeing with um, ideology that you don't necessarily agree with um, which I find is quite a um, universal um, emotions that you know most people feel so I kind of modified the story from a boy in the ministry, um, change it to um, a boy who lives in a small town and to make it more universal. And in terms of the characters, I made it's a mod uh, model after myself, but I made it as generic as possible so people can project themselves, people can see themselves in them. And the result was quite um, surprisingly really well received um, of the people who, like a lot of people came to me 
and they um, thanked me for making this work and they told me how much it meant to them because they feel this way in so-and-so you know, time period of their lives. And that kind of was the motivation of, for me to you know, keep making things that are personal, but you know, you know, in a way many people relate to. And it's also interesting with Tide, my second graphic novel, um, so I devised, devised it as um, there are two worlds, basically, and there is the ink um, part, which is reality. It's kind of black and white because the person just being through um, just lost someone uh, important in their lives. And with the digital part, um, uh, there is like a bird and the bird is kind of the thing that all horrible things happen to. And basically you go through the book and the bird, you know, witness the uh, formation of a of a like emotional landscape and everything's beautiful and then started to flood and the bird is the one who witnessed the whole everything and the man uh, the ink in the ink reality he just taking a shower basically so that I think that's my way of this disassociating with the um, traumatic experience I guess and that's how I um, put my like personal perspective uh, into my work without being you know too vulnerable or like having this kind of another thing um, to represent, to, to go through this experience rather than myself, but also it's myself in a way, if that makes sense. Kayla, do you have anything you want to share about this or is it okay if I go? Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm worried that people again will sleepy. Maybe it's just because I'm in the nighttime zone, but uh, maybe that could have been the last question. Even though I obviously never want this to end, I just want to give everyone like a screen break maybe, but. We'll, have, we'll, we'll say goodbye, we won't just like leave. Um, uh, thank you, Natyada, for your question. Can't wait to see your work, just requested follow. Um, but you asked about vulnerability representing yourself. And uh, I've just been thinking about what Lee said about fiction and also what Jason shared about um, the art of concealing and revealing. And I guess let me think like, okay, this is such a freak thing to do, but like I, I brought a bunch of comics to this talk. So I just gonna go like one or two pages from ones that I think are really interesting works of fiction. Um, I'm getting a lot of private messages in the chat about what books I recommend, so I just thought I'd shout out a couple books. Uh, Seichi Hayashi's Red Colored Elegy. In Kayla's uh, like prompt for this talk, she actually mentioned like avant-garde manga or like manga that's like kind of weird or like in that kind of Godo phase of like maybe it was Gado. There was like a comic magazine that began with G and ends with O, and it was about like uh, kind of making ugly or strange comics and like there's this scene between these two people who are like lovers that are also fighting and I think um like I don't know if this is the author depicting himself it's unlikely but at the same time for me if you drew this like you felt this. like if you drew this this was you at some point in time so in that way fiction is like burying your soul and I think yeah whatever character or form it takes um it's moving like I read this and I was like Oh my goodness, I don't know why I feel this so viscerally, just like that weird thin line between crying and laughing or, or resentment and love. And uh, similarly, there was this book, Hui Hui, and this is by a very young Taiwanese artist. Some people at her show told me it's like 22 or 23. And it's this, well, it's a little PG-18, maybe I can't show it in this talk, but it's like just like, a, it's like kind of an erotic watercolor comic about someone having um, kind of like really painful sexual experiences. And then I, I saw this book and at, at a show, a solo show of, of her works. And I was thinking like, I cannot believe you made that. Like it was so good. And at the same time, I was like, that is just like ripping off a bandaid in front of like a few hundred people. And at the same time, regardless of what um, this author has experienced that or not, I just felt like there was something just like really intense about it where when, when you see people are willing to go to that place, it feels really empowering. And I guess I'm just gonna maybe close my long talking but with that like, I ask myself sometimes, is making comics about yourself more vulnerable than like anything you have to do in your real life? Like falling in love or like being a person or trying to like fix stuff with your family. Like that is so hard every day. So I just think like drawing little pictures of yourself and throwing them on the internet is not so bad, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just think, not, I'm not saying it's not super hard. I'm not saying that having doubts and anxiety about it isn't it's super real. And at the same time, I don't know, like the, the, the illustrator Jillian Tamaki made this post about her graphic novel when she was penciling it. And the caption was, here I am stressing about something that people are going to read for one hour and put away. And like, it was self-deprecating. And obviously her books are like cherished treasures. But I just think that's like so funny. It's like, we are like stabbing ourselves at our desk. And it's like, people will 
cherish the comic and they will also move on hopefully so it's just like we don't need to act like every single act of representation is going to like become our reputation or our identity when also sometimes i think about like i'm in the indie comic world like there are people who are like kim kardashian they have that level of exposure scrutiny and hatred and stuff and we we're like indie comic artists like there are big people in the indie comic scene and like they're big in like this weird niche way like being a big at cricket or something so um i'm sure your work is wonderful can't wait to see more of it but yeah maybe um, kayla you can wrap <laughs> i'm so happy you said that kaylin i just i have nothing more to say than like an add-on to that which is that i don't know if you've read uh, adrian tamina's latest book but uh there's a quote from daniel klaus at the start of it which is like being a famous cartoonist is like being the most famous badminton player like maybe like extremely, extremely niche fame, <laughs> but not real. <laughs> yeah, that's very well said and really good conclusion as to the whole talk in general. Um, I think, um, and in making comics, you always reveal a part of you no matter what. I think it's just either making it conscious or just pointing it out for the audience or just sort of, being open enough to share about certain things, but they would always actually reflect in your own work, no matter what. Um, and also, even if we're famous, then it was still in the comic world, unless you're going off doing MVs and heading off um, Met Gala or something. But anyways, um, yeah. Um, is there anything else or? I can't believe we talked for two hours, actually. Time flew by so fast. Um, Thank you so much for organizing this and, you know, making it happen to everyone who hung out with us for two hours. Y'all are like, yeah, great capacity. Really. <laughs> And thank you everyone who was just chattering in this wonderful chat the entire time. It's been very fun seeing all the little contributions on the side. Should we say goodnight like we're children's TV show hosts? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's been a great Bye. night. Bye. Good night. Good morning, wherever you are. Thank Thanks you everyone for coming. Bye.